or consent to recording. This meeting is and, being recorded. And are aware uh, and accept that the section will be recorded and made available uh, to, for replay via YouTube. Okay, so now I must tell you, and thanks to all of you to be here. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I want to tell you that it is a pleasure for me to be here presenting the first webinar of the BIMER project. BIMER is an innovative health initiative project, which will be implementing, implemented during the next five years and aims to enhance patient support, promote patient uh, uh, adherence and improve health outcomes. As you uh, all know, uh, adherence, uh, adherence is a complex and dy dynamic phenomenon with, with a, a wide range of interacting factors uh, impact on treatment, treatment taking behavior. Beamer project intend with this series of, of webinars to join international experts for an open discussion on adherence across vari various diseases. For this first webinar, we have the honor to have here three very important speakers uh, on this field that are members of the expert advisory board of Beamer project. Uh, and for us, this is a, a good moment and a, a, a share moment uh, uh, of knowledge on, on, on adherence. To start, I have the pleasure to, of presenting John Wyman, which is Emeritus Professor and Co-Director of the Center for Adherence Research and Education of the King's College in, in, in London. And he will talk about no adherence to medical plan, plans as a public health issue. John, thanks a lot for being here and the floor is yours. Good, thanks, uh, Elisio. Um, I'm now going to uh, attempt to share my screen. So I'm hoping, can you see my first slide? Yeah. We do. Yeah. yeah. Good, great. Good. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation, and, uh, and it's good to be here. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I've never spoken to this title before, um, and it's an interesting one to think of medication adherence as a public health problem. You know, we usually look at it as an individual problem and so on. So it's sort of going to be partly my usual talk, but um, following me, um, you know, the talks from Rob and from Yorb will, will overlap a little bit with some of the topics I'm going to raise in this talk. So quick overview of of what I'd like to present with you today. So just to, I think, you know, when we're thinking about a public health issue, we need to think about something as having impact. Um, you know, what, what is this thing which is affecting quality of healthcare, patients' health, and so on. So I'm gonna briefly start with thinking about the sort of impact of non-adherence. And I'm sure that's something which uh, Job will talk about um, in the third um, of these talks when he looks at the health economic uh, impacts of non-adherence. Then I'm going to again briefly talk about uh, you know, how we can understand the nature of the problem, um, you know, what causes non-adherence. And again, I think Rob will, will go into much more detail in that. And then from a, if you like, from a public health point of view, I want to think about some of the barriers that exist in both patients, healthcare professionals, and healthcare systems, which maybe get in the way of providing adherence support. And, and uh, the very last part of my talk, very briefly, I'm gonna think about the sorts of public health solutions that could be applied um, to improving adherence. So I think one of the um, really good recent papers, um, everybody knows the WHO paper on non-adherence that in a way really sets the scene for thinking about non-adherence as a public health problem. But one of the other good, really good working papers in recent years has been the OECD um, health working paper, which came out uh, four years ago now, 
OECD, if you don't know it, is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they bring out working papers very frequently about major issues um, which have impacts on, on society from very much from an economic perspective. But their, their paper on looking at adherence um, really, I think, sets the scene for thinking about um, non-adherence as a public health issue. And they actually have a quote or they quote two or three times in their paper, they talk about non-adherence being a major public health problem because it contributes to, well, they estimated then 200,000 premature deaths in Europe every year, major health consequences and major health economic consequences. And some of these figures are down there. And they also outlined, as many other people have done, that you know, there are many, many people this applies to, a whole lot of people, perhaps the order about 15, 20% who never even begin their medicines. So they're clearly a group that needs to be thought about and defined. And then of those who do get, take, get their medicines, you know, maybe we're lucky if 50% of those take them regularly. Uh, and then uh, you know, of those who even take them regularly, two years later, if they're on a lifelong medication, um, half of those people won't be taking the medication. So, you know, in public health terms, this is huge. It's huge in terms of the number of people it applies to, and it's huge in terms of the impacts that it has on people's well-being and health, and on healthcare systems in terms of budgetary and other costs. So, we just think you get some. For example, these are data from um, the U.S. and uh, just take one condition. I mean, obviously, we can't look at every condition this afternoon. But if we think about non-adherence in the context of cardiovascular disease, we know that it non, the patients who are non-adherent have much, much higher risk of mortality, of ending up with additional hospital visits and having recurrent cardiovascular events. You know, the health outcomes are clearly much worse. Um, they talk about, and this, these are data from Ian Cronish and, and colleagues from oh, about almost 10 years ago now, and they talk about 125,000 avoidable deaths each year in the US alone. That figure is clearly higher now. And they talk about 3 billion potential savings. Again, the figures, if you think about the figures from my last slide, um, these figures vary hugely. And I think Job um, in, in the third of these talks will spell out in much more detail some of the different sorts of health economic impacts of non-adherence. And then um, the, this typical figure we see for patients on long-term medication, 40 to, 40 to 50% of patients being non-adherent um, in cardiovascular disease. So briefly, and I don't want to um, overlap too much with Job's talk, but um, really taken with this fairly recent systematic re review from Cutler and colleagues, looking at some of these economic impacts. They looked at, this is a systematic review where they looked at uh, almost 80 studies across a whole range of disease groups. Uh, and they, fi they find the, the actual cost of non-adherence varies hugely. Uh, what they clearly showed is that, you know, lower levels were associated with higher total costs. That was a very clear message. And again, that's been reported everywhere. Um, but the actual annual um, adjusted disease specific costs of non-adherence per person range from just under $1,000 to $44,000. Again, this is quite old data now, it's seven years old. Um, the costs attributed to all causes of non-adherence uh, were, were even higher. So the range here, um, again, we may, uh, you may talk about this range, Obviously, it depends on the type of disease, the cost of the treatments, and so on, but also how the costs are estimated. And the, you know, the uh, sort of rather dark art of health economics, you know, has this, you know, variation in, in the methodology that's used for um, working out healthcare costs. And it, it's a complex process. So really, we have to think why. And I think, you know, from you know, if we're thinking, you know, in terms with our sort of public health hat on, we need to think about, well, there are various reasons why patients don't engage with their treatment. Um, and I'm going to talk about those to start with, but there are also um, factors which are due to the actual behavior of healthcare professionals, people, people working in healthcare systems that contribute to 
the prevalence and the continuation of non-adherence. And also there are uh, healthcare system factors, you know, the way in which healthcare is organized. So I think we need to look at each. Um, and so if we start out by thinking about patient behavior, and if we go back to the early days, and the early days, when I'm talking about the early days, which is sort of more or less when I started in this area, which is sort of right in the... Oh, we've got some, uh, somebody with their microphone still on. Um, anyhow, uh, the, um, yeah, in the sort of early research on non-adherence, probably, you know, 1970s, 1980s, and a lot of that early work was really based on the idea that non-adherence was just basically a result of rather poor communication in healthcare. That, you know, somehow the right sort of information hadn't been given or patients hadn't understood the information they'd been given. And that this really affected the ability of the patient to remember and, and take their medicines. And some of the early research was great, really interesting studies, um, but it's led to a rather sort of one track view of non-adherence, which is that it's all about not having information or not being able to remember. And all those early interventions around that time, some of which were really quite interesting, quite effective, um, were based on this, were based on giving people maybe more information, explaining things in more detail, and typically sending people reminders to sort of jog their memory. And um, what's really interesting is that that is still the basis of so many adherence interventions. If you look at the literally hundreds of apps which are out there now to promote better adherence, they're really based on fairly crude reminder systems. So still that understanding, that very limited understanding still persists. And, and a great study, if you wanna be reminded of this, is the study which I've quoted here by Chowdhury and colleagues. And this is a, a huge, huge study in a, in, a, in a top, top journal called the Remind Study. And it involved 50,000 people who were identified as not being very adherent or being quite poorly adherent to their medication across a whole range of long-term conditions. They tried out four, they randomly allocated the people with four different reminder devices, and uh, they absolutely failed entirely to change their adherence level, something like 15% um, when they started and 15% when they finished, whichever reminder system they were, because these were people who were already had already become non-adherent. Um, so the, the impression one gets is these reminder systems, they have a place, but they only work in people who are actually motivated, in people for whom forgetting is their primary problem. They want to do it, but they need a bit of a prompt. So what do we know more recently? Well, I think there are a number, a couple of really important points that have been raised about the nature of non-adherence. One is this recognition. We're not looking at a single point in time and a single behavior. And the work of uh, Bernard Breyens and, and colleagues and published in a really important paper in 2013 really stresses these three phases of adherence behavior. You know, the beginning to take the treatment, either cashing in the prescription or even when you get the prescription home, actually making a start, the so-called uptake stage. And as, as the OECD identified earlier, probably in the region of 15 to 20% of patients never ever really get going. So that's one sort of a problem, you know, getting people started on the medicines. Then prob probably the biggest challenge is getting people to take medicines regularly and to fit it into their daily pattern, the so-called implementation. Um, and linked to that is persistence, this continuing to take treatment over time, even let's say if you don't think it's making much difference or whatever. So I think that's important. That's a really important realization. And there are different factors that are involved in each stage of that adherence process. But then what's happened really since that early research, really in the last 50 or so years, is that there are a huge number of factors that have been identified as possible causes of non-adherence. If you look at the Kardash and colleague uh, review of almost 10 years ago now, they identified something like six or 700 possible reasons why people may become non-adherent. So then we are left with a task of well, how, do, how do we classify these? 
And how do we sort of maybe put them into groups which are understandable? And I've put down a couple, um, a number of ways of thinking about these different reasons. For example, we can think about them as being modifiable, you know, things like people's moods, beliefs, their levels of support and so on, as opposed to reasons which are really unmodifiable, perhaps factors to do with um, their financial situation or um, their age um, or their gender or whatever. Um, also, I think a lot of people uh, really like the idea of splitting reasons for not adherence into what we call intentional, you know, where people really are making their mind up, they know what they're doing, versus those which are unintentional, you know, where people perhaps there are barriers or issues that stop people becoming adherent. Um, a third way of looking, which um, you're going to hear about much more in, in uh, Rob's talk, is about this notion of perceptions against practicalities, a really good distinction from a psychological perspective between those things which um, are inside, if you like, people's beliefs and their motivations and so on, as opposed to a whole range of factors which, as it were, get in the way and, and, and stop people in acting and, and uh, um, being able to, to take their medicines regularly. And then there's a, a, a approach, another approach, which is very similar, but splits the factors into three groups called the capability, opportunity, and motivation approach called the COMBI approach, uh, which is one I've tended to be using recently, but not exclusively. And this really sees non-adherence dividing up into sort of three groups of factors, capability factors to do with the, how good somebody's understanding is, whether they can remember, whether they can plan and organize, and also their physical ability to take the treatment, you know, their ability to use an inhaler or an injectable. Then in the middle, we have factors outside the individual which can stop them you know, achieving adherence, maybe the quality of their relationship with the healthcare provider, the support they get from other people in their own community and their home, financial factors, which can be really important in some healthcare systems, and just their ability to access healthcare, how close they are, and what sort of access they have. So they can all obviously affect the extent to which people are following their treatment. And then the, this huge area of motivation, the sort of beliefs that people have about their illness and treatment, which you're gonna hear much more about in a moment, people's fears, their emotions, how well developed their habits are for medicine taking, and their, their sort of confidence generally in taking medicines. So a whole range of factors can influence uh, patient behavior. We think about healthcare professionals. Um, again, I think there's some really important factors which have OECD quite rightly said have not been looked at sufficiently. We know that, for example, that uh, many studies have shown this is a sort of lack of awareness amongst healthcare professionals about how just how big this problem is. Um, in if we look at the routine consultation behavior of healthcare professionals, we find you know, actually they don't often check if people are being adherent, particularly say if treatment's not working. Um, they often, if they do ask about adherence, they do so in, in a way which is not really conducive for patients answering openly and honestly. And they're just not very good at knowing who's adherent and who's not, because it's difficult to see. And they tend to be sort of a bit biased. They tend to think, you know, their patients are pretty adherent, but other people's aren't. So in other words, they don't think it's their problem. And they sort of tend to not think it's their problem as something they have to deal with anyhow. You know, it's, it's a problem for somebody else, for the pharmacist or whatever, but um, not necessarily, let's say, for the doctor or specialist nurse or whatever. So a lot of factors amongst healthcare professionals and the systems they work in that can have an influence on levels of adherence. And then if we think about healthcare systems, I think we're thinking about particularly here the barriers. And some of these overlap a bit. So if we think about routine healthcare and the way routine, you know, day-to-day, -day, either hospital or general practice consultations are organized. Again, I think, you know, what one sees in health, general healthcare practice, as I said earlier, a lot of people don't see this as part of their job. So it's not factored into the healthcare system. I said, you know, it's probably not, the, the prevalence is, is underestimated. Um, it's not, if, it's, if it's approached in healthcare, it's often done so in a way which is not conducive to really good patient support. 
And also, I think there are a couple of other reasons. I think our healthcare professionals are not well equipped to manage the different reasons underlying non-adherence, that really understand the different sorts of factors that can influence patient behavior. And many complain they don't have time and routine appointments. In fact, indeed, if we look at GP appointments around the world, you see actually huge variation. There's a couple of really quite interesting data from interesting studies looking at how long GP appointments are. Now, obviously in Europe, um, you know, GP appointments tend to be sort of 10 minutes or longer, but, you know, it's a huge variation. In somewhere like Sweden, you know, people have 20 minutes on average with their GP. Um, whereas if you go down to different parts of the third world, you know, in, indeed, including China, you know, this is down to literally minutes, one or two minutes being the average consultation. And so, you know, time is an issue and time is a challenge and it's a challenge for healthcare systems I think, as to how to factor in that time, how to make that time work. So all these huge adherence problems don't just disappear, um, you know, un unattended as it were. Also, I think healthcare systems are, present barriers to patients too, partly because of the way healthcare uh, consultations are organized. And I think what we know from patients, they often end up hiding non-adherence from the clinician. Um, because they, you know, they don't wish to disappoint their clinician or get told off. There's something about patients seeing their role here as, you know, wanting to be good patients. And so they tend to be defensive. If they're, if they're asked very direct questions, you know, do you take your medicines? We know that very few patients who are actually non-adherent uh, will actually say that. So that's, you know, it's a real fault in the system. It's a terrible um, indictment of the system that it creates this sort of barrier for patients. And uh, when, you know, we, we know from studies of consultations that these motivational and opportunity factors are rarely addressed. You know, if anybody takes on adherence in a routine consultation, the focus usually is on giving more information or, you know, providing some sort of reminder system like a special pillbox or whatever. So if we try and put all this together and think about well, what are we trying to do, if you like, if we think about non-adherence as a public health problem, as you know, something which goes way beyond the patient, but really is very endemic to the whole pattern of healthcare. I think one can think of, and this, this is not an exclusive list, this is just me really brainstorming. What could, from a you know, public health campaigns, could we imagine a public health campaign on the importance of adherence and being open with HCPs, not you know, hiding things, just as public health campaigns can you know, talk about you know, the importance of uh, wearing a safety belt or many other factors which protect health. Um, I think there's huge scope. And, and, and particularly, you know, there are many public health campaigns now looking at you know, what to do if you notice a particular symptom like a breast lump or something which might be indicative of cardiovascular disease. So I think drawing the public's attention to this, and I'm constantly stunned by conversations I have with people out there in the communities, friends, people I bump into, uh, and so on, who really don't know the extent of this as a, as, and the size of the non-adherence problem. If we think about healthcare professionals, what we can do, what are the sort of solutions there? Well, clearly, I think very much it's an issue around training to create much better awareness amongst healthcare professionals of the problems of non-adherence, the extent, and to improve their skills in both being able to pick up non-adherence and to support patients um, in, in taking their, their treatment. And I think for healthcare systems, really, I would see them as really needing to prioritize adherence support within routine healthcare. One of the things which the OECD report did was to look at the 36, I think, countries who are represented by the um, OECD and look at whether any country was actually making any serious attempt to look at non-adherence and to build it into healthcare practice, routine healthcare practice. And to be honest, none were doing it. There were little bits and pieces, um, but really none were doing it. So 
I think there's huge scope. One thinks with a public health hat on for changing the, the whole picture of the way adherence is, is dealt with in, uh, by healthcare systems. So thank you very much. Um, apologies for going slightly over time, uh, but that uh, is all I really wanted to present today. John, thank you so much for your uh, important presentation and for uh, the this knowledge that you share are sharing with you uh, with us. Uh, no, in the hand of the three speakers, we can put some questions to, to, to them. So now we go, we have now Rob Horn, which is professor at uh, University College of, uh, of London, and he has developed a range of tools uh, and models for assessing patients' perspectives of illness. Uh, and treatment, uh, the, the, the questionnaire on beliefs about medicines and the medication adherence report scale, the MARS scale, have been developed by Rob. So, Rob, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here now. And uh, let's uh, talk about adherence related beliefs and barriers. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thank you very much, uh, Alessio, and to John for an excellent uh, opening talk. Um, in, our, in our session. So I, I'm going to try and share screen uh, for a moment. I hope this works. And uh, yes, I think so. Um, hopefully you can all see uh, the screens there. Okay. Um, so my brief is to talk about um, adherence related uh, beliefs and barriers. And I'm going to try and follow on from uh, John's sort of comprehensive overview of this from uh, a sort of public health challenge, um, but and to focus on four topics really. Um, and understanding the nature of the adherence cha challenge from the perspective of individuals, um, I want to present a behavioral mod model for categorizing barriers, something that John's already introduced and then talk about the fundamental role of beliefs in adherence and the implication for solutions. So as John has um, pointed out, we really need to focus um, on this complex issue. And it's really interesting to see it as a public health challenge, actually. And as John said, you know, we need to get better at optimizing the healthcare system in terms of our policy and practice, patient and provider interactions. But what I'm going to focus on in my talk is the patient, because they must always be, of course, the center of our model, because whatever we do in terms of the system and healthcare providers will only work if it engages well with patients and really is able to um, understand the, the barriers and drivers of adherence from the perspective of patients. So, so uh, this, this is my sort of brief, it's the inner circle, if you like. And there are two key challenges that we need to be aware of. The first thing is that non-adherence is not um, a trait. Uh, I think John clearly, you know, the data that John presented clearly shows this. Adherence rates vary, not just between patients, but within the same patient over time and across treatments. How many of us, have ever been prescribed a treatment that we haven't uh, taken fully. I certainly have. In fact, I think that we should see non-adherence as the norm rather than the exception. So it's very prevalent, it's everywhere as, uh, as we've already learned. And so from this, we can see that adherence and non-adherence are best understood in terms of the interaction between an individual and a particular illness and treatment, because someone can be adherent to one treatment, but not another. So that's a fundamental challenge for us. How do we actually begin to do that? And how do we operationalize it in practice? Then the second key challenge is that information and knowledge does not guarantee adherence. Whereas, as John pointed out, a lot of the interventions that we're still doing are based on uh, information, telling people how to do it, and also reminders, of course. But 
This is of limited effect. It's not unhelpful. Obviously, people need to understand what to do and how to do it. The point is, it doesn't really nail the problem. We have an information action gap. And information, in order for it to result in action, needs to bridge that gap. So the kind of way that we can approach this from a behavioral science point of view is to ask about the nature of the gap. And as we've learned from John's talk, there are very many reasons why people might not take medication. But actually, they boil down to two things, in my view, two key components, and that is can't and don't want to. Now, that is an entirely obvious interpretation, isn't it? You don't need some a behavioral scientist to tell you that. But actually, failure to implement that basic insight is why non-adherence still costs us billions in terms of uh, wasted treatment and impact on uh, health. So if we dig a little bit further, I, I see the basic ingredients of adherence as being two things. Really, we have to understand it in terms of motivation and ability. Now, when we look a bit more closer at this, let's take the orange circle, ability. Non-adherence can be unintentional when the person wants to take the treatment, but they're prevented from doing so by barriers that are beyond their control. They may not be able to afford it. The prescription might not be available to them. They find it difficult to organize it or even to take the treatment, you know, manage an inhaler, open the package if they have arthritis. These are really big limitations in ability, capability and resources. So I tend to classify opportunity as uh, John mentioned, is also a very important aspect here, but I tend to see opportunity as working either through motivation or ability. It's an important factor, but it works through one of these two in my view. So how do we understand the person's ability? How can we identify the capability and resource barriers, and how can we help them overcome them? These are the practicalities. The um, Healthcare system and pharma industry are often very active in this space. We, we give reminders, we can give clear instructions, we can help people schedule their treatment, we can simplify regimens. These are all very useful and helpful things. The problem is they don't solve the problem entirely. And that is because much of the non-adherence is actually not because the person can't, it's because they don't want to. And it's in the blue circle. It's intentional, if you like. And it, in order to understand that, we need to look in a different space at the perceptions that drive our motivation to start and continue with a treatment. The beliefs, emotions, and background biases that tend to determine whether we think taking this treatment is a good idea or not. And that often is absolutely the missing ingredient in adherence support. If we apply this simple framework, which we call the perceptions and practicalities framework, then the implication is that for everyone prescribed a medicine, particularly for the long term, we should identify whether they have perceptual barriers, whether they have practical barriers, and tailor adherence support by taking solutions off the shelf in a package that addresses the perceptions and practicalities that are relevant for them. But we rarely do that. That's the bad news. The good news is I think we could actually do this far more um, extensively and improve adherence by tailoring support. Now, how do we do that? Let me, let's maybe focus a little bit more on the blue circle. So, but of course, first recognizing that these internal factors of motivation and ability are of course influenced by the environment, access to services, community and family support, resources, finance, transportation. These are the opportunity issues that are clearly recognized in COMBI. In suggesting um, motivation and ability, of course, I'm not 
reducing the importance of these, but rather that they tend to either act by increasing someone's motivation or their ability. So if we're focusing on the individual and we want to get the basic ingredients, I think this is the place to start. Now, beliefs are the first barrier that we need to cross because if a person doesn't want to do it, making it easier is unlikely to work. So what are the key beliefs? Now, I, I worked, John and I worked a, a lot. Um, it seems like an awful long time ago now. Well, it is an awful long time ago, the 90s. Uh, it seems like yesterday. Um, in trying to identify, you know, how can we understand what the key beliefs are that will drive engagement uh, with treatment? Uh, you know, people can believe the moon is made out of cheese. And we focused uh, in this work on beliefs about medication. And uh, there are two elements that are important. What people believe about pharmaceuticals in general and what people believe about the specific prescribed treatment. What I'm going to focus on today is how people think about the prescription and how we can understand the processes by which someone might come out of that evaluation thinking, I don't think it's a great idea for me to take this stuff as it's been prescribed. And this is a uh, framework called the Necessity Concerns Framework, which helps us understand the key belief drivers of, in, of uh, adherence and engagement. And there's, um, uh, you know, uh, quite a few uh, studies that have supported the potential utility of this in helping us understand some of the key beliefs that might drive um, adherence. And uh, let's uh, look perhaps at what we mean by necessity beliefs. So a necessity belief is not the same as believing the treatment will be effective or um, beneficial. It's rather the answer to two questions that the person asks themselves. How much do I really need to do this to achieve something that's important to me? And secondly, can I get away without doing it? So the answer to those two questions formulates our necessity belief. We can believe that something's beneficial or effective, but what really counts is how important is that benefit to us? And that's often a missing link because we talk to the patient in terms of benefit and efficacy rather than a story that communicates personal necessity. If we do believe that treatment's effective, uh, necessary, that's just the first hurdle. Then our concerns start to kick in. We ask ourselves, what's the downside? So lots of studies have used this approach and here's an example of one. And what we need to understand is side effects are obviously a concern, but often patients' concerns go far broader and they encompass beliefs about treatment. So this is a study that was done just as an example in Crohn's and colitis in over 1800 UK patients. And it shows the pattern of concerns, maps the concerns. These are the percentage on the right of patients who agree or strongly agree with each of the statements on the left. You see about halfway down over a third say, yeah, this medicine does cause unpleasant side effects. But by far the most common concerns are concerns about long-term effects. These are all based on beliefs, beliefs that if you take them treatment readily now, it'd be less effective in future. Concerns about becoming too dependent. Now, dependence is an interesting one. And one of the things that has come out in that is that that's often not about addiction, but rather the meaning of the medicine. How does it affect how I see myself and how others see me when I'm on this long-term medication? We've even found things like it's a symbol of lack of faith. So there are beliefs about the meaning. So we need to take account of these because they often relate to adherence. Often there's a disconnect. I think John alluded to this earlier, that clinicians may not even be aware that the patient has doubts or concerns about non-adherence. They focus on other things, the sort of side effects that worry clinicians are the clinically significant ones, the ones that worry patients might be subjective side effects. Will I lose my hair? Will it affect my appearance? And also, 
patients are often reluctant to reveal a doubt or a concern or to say they're not taking the treatment because they think the patient will, the doctor will interpret that as a doubt in them. They have two ideas. I like and trust the clinician, but I don't like and trust the treatment. So the whole of the problem goes underground. Why do patients doubt they need the treatment? What are their concerns? Well, one of the key issues here, and we don't have time to go into this, is that patients need to see a common sense fit between their ideas about the problem, how they think about and understand the illness, and their ideas about the proposed solution, the treatment. And for many patients, that fit is just not clear. And we can understand this in terms of um, what I call common sense defaults, which are common ways that people think about illness and treatment, which left unchecked will often lead to non-adherence. But if we understood them and spoke to patients about their illness and treatment in a different way, we could change and offset them. So here are some examples of common sense defaults. A classic one is no symptoms, no problem. Much of what we prescribe is maintenance treatment, the patient doesn't feel any better when they take it. If they miss a few doses, which we all do, they don't feel any worse. And that can reinforce the idea that this treatment is not very important to me. Maybe I don't need it. And expectations of treatment linked to symptoms are very powerful here. But we can change these by intervention. Left unchecked, they often lead to non-adherence. Other common sense default ideas, chemical bad natural good. Medicines accumulate in the body over time. The more powerful the medicine, the more harmful it is. Suspicion of the pharmaceutical industry. If I express doubts or concerns, the doctor will interpret it as a doubt in them. So we haven't got time to deal with all these now, but what our research shows is that once we can identify these, they can be changed by simply changing the message. So it's still scientifically accurate, but it, it takes account of common sense beliefs. We need to move on from traditional methods of segmentation on gender, age, et cetera, other behaviors, because they don't work. These two patients are twins. They come out in the segmentation as being exactly the same, but what's in their heads is different. And the only way we can tell that is to assess what's in their heads. And we have valid and reliable tools for doing this. So finally, we have a, an approach that we can apply to adherence support. We need to take a no blame approach. There are three step uh, perceptions and practicalities approach to facilitate an honest and open discussion. We need to communicate a common sense rationale for why treatment is needed that takes account of patients' perceptions of the illness and symptom expectations. Second point, we need to understand and address their concerns. Um, and thirdly, we need to make it as easy and convenient as possible. We can, there are now innovations that can help us apply this. So for example, um, uh, apps that actually profile patients in terms of necessity, beliefs, concerns, and then target messages to overcome these. And studies show that um, this can overcome misplaced beliefs, doubts about necessity and concerns, and improve adherence. So in conclusion, you know, we need to continue to address the practicalities using interventions that we currently use, but this only gets us really to level one. If we take account of beliefs, even if we give static untailored information, this takes us to an improved level. The third level is when we can tailor the approach using perceptions and practicalities approach. And what um, there's some evidence to show that as you go up the pyramid, your program efficacy and value uh, increases. So in conclusion, we need to recognize that patients don't come as a blank sheet that we can write the instructions on. They come with pre-existing beliefs about their condition and treatment. And these are usually logical, common sense interpretations, but they're often mistaken from a medical point of view. And this is really the challenge for how we can improve adherence, is to understand these beliefs and expectations 
and to address them in our interventions. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Rob. It was excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, with a lot of information that we can in the hand to discuss and uh, take for uh, Tony. So uh, finally, we have with us uh, Job van Boven, which comes from Uni University Medical Center of Groningen. He is a health economics and real world drug outcomes expert, and he is also the founding director of the Medication Adherence Expertise Center in the north of Netherlands. And he is also the, the chair of Enable Cost Action, uh, which is a, 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 a network, a European network with 39 countries enrolled uh, and this is a cost action on adherence and uh, it's a pleasure for me to have you here and uh, to present uh, and to talk about the clinical and economic impacts of no adherence uh, so Rob, thanks a lot and uh, the floor is yours Thank you, uh, Elisio, and also uh, thanks to, uh, to uh, Rob and John for such excellent uh, talks that really set the scene but for me now it's a challenge um that because there's an overlap to go more in depth in in, in some of the issues raised around the economic and, and public health impact which i will try to do um so i would like to take you along the the true broad clinical and economic impact of a medication non-adherence and basically this picture would already tell you a lot um i hope you can see my screen Yes. Yes. Okay. So here you see uh, an, an elder person being uh, admitted to to the hospital. You see it's a white bar on the face because only for criminals it's black bars. But for patients, we should also be cautious in not identifying them. But this is a patient uh, with 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 asthma admitted for the third time with an, a lung attack, an exacerbation. Uh, uh, your, uh, sorry, real quickly, I think we are still seeing the first slide because you're not in presentation mode yet. Okay, um, how can I go to presentation mode? Stop sharing. Share again, probably. Yeah, try one more time. I think it froze up. All right, yes. Yeah. So now you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks for letting me know. So again, here you see um, uh, this patient being admitted to the hospital for the third time with a lung attack and exacerbation. This patient is being prescribed multiple medications, but you expect poor adherence. And already here you see the direct implication probably of not taking a medicine is that your disease will worsen. You get admitted to the hospital and face it, many hospitalizations cost money. You don't always have to pay directly in, in many countries, um, at least in my country, but still one day on, on, on uh, in the hospital is a few hundred euros per day or up to over 1000 euros for more intensive care units. So already this is a direct impact. Also, if this person would be low at a, a still working age, this patient is not able to work. So you see some indirect impact on, on the society of, of not being able to work. But there's some hidden features also that we not always expect related to non-adherence. And that's on the next page. So my question here would be, I will give you two scenarios what would be the most cost-effective approach for this patient uh, if you would be the treating physician? So here you have the treatment choice. So you would have the pharmacological substance you could choose. You can cho cho choose the dose, the regimen, the administration route, being an inhaler, oral therapy. And then you can look at um, some of the asthma outcomes for this patient, their quality of life, exacerbation, lung function. So. Some of the approaches many healthcare professionals take is they somehow might know that the drug is not fully working. Um, and, and but yeah, they accept they cannot measure that properly. So they accept it. And the most intuitive thing to do is, okay, the patient is still uncontrolled with this drug, I add another drug. So, or you increase the dose. But this is another economic consequence of uh, non-adherence to the first drug, which is resulting in the prescription of a second drug. And that second drug is often 
uh, more expensive or giving more side effects as well. Another option would be to say, okay, I understand adherence is an essential element to understand drug response and to practice personalized medicine. So I assess adherence, try to improve it probably and make an informed treatment decision. So I take into account the factors that are driving um, the discrepancy between the treatment you're prescribing and the expected outcomes you would see. So you take into account your use, maybe to take into account some comorbidities or, or some genetics we're not talking about, but many uh, physicians still fail to take into account the behavioral aspects in their treatment decisions. And they maybe look at sometimes at some pharmacokinetics, but still medication adherence is a huge uh, aspect of, of personalized medicine. And then you'll get some very nice algorithm that has been proposed in the European Restor Journal some years ago by, uh, by uh, the group of Richard Costello. So you could, good insights into adherence helps clinical decision making. So instead of saying, okay, this person has persistent symptoms, uh, I increase the dose or add the treatment, which would happen regularly in, in about one third of patients without knowing adherence. But if you know that adherence was not good, you could still focus on improving adherence first. For others, if you don't see complaints and adherence is good, you might even think of reducing the dose. So again, some economic benefits here. And for some patients that have no complaints and no adherence, probably they don't even have the disease and they don't need a drug at all. Again, a possibility to reduce cost as long as you properly measure adherence. So there's more than just the direct parts, but the challenge here is improving adherence for who would this be relevant? And basically you have heard this in the talks of John and Rob as well. Non-adherence is highly prevalent in any of the chronic diseases. The WHO always, the report mentions the 50%, so around half of our patients, and you see different ways of measuring, but generally speaking, around half of our patients can do better. And these are also figures you have seen before. So for, the, uh, for Europe, it has been estimated that non-adherence has been related with 200,000 premature deaths and 125 billions of potentially preventable direct costs like hospital admissions, emergency care, additional consultations, and also for the US, similar figures are, are being mentioned. Note that these are highly dependent, of course, on the cost categories that are included and even the years that they were published. published. So the 105 was an earlier figure and 10 years later, uh, an update uh, of the New England Institute uh, was published already uh, almost tripling this amount to 290 billion US dollars. And not even including some of the additional indirect costs. We'll get back to that issue. And here we're talking about a real world impact of, of, of non-adherence. Also, we have the trial setting, the clinical trial setting of pe people often believe that in clinical trials, non-adherence is no issue. Um, they, they basically assume these are so strictly selected these patients and these are also strictly monitored and sometimes even removed from a trial if they are non-adherent but still 10 to 12 percent does take does not take their treatment uh, during a clinical trial and also in long-term clinical trials people remain people so they will stop treatment at some point and also here's some economic gain because Clinical trials are super expensive. Um, there has been some estimations for a typical phase three trial that for a 1% in adherence, uh, the cost gain could be uh, over 300,000 US dollars. And simply because if we measure adherence, adherence increases, we need a smaller sample size to show the benefits of our medicine. Um, and then this study has also been mentioned by John uh, briefly, and this is maybe one of the most recent and, and highly uh, cited studies on the economic impact of, of non-adherence across diseases. This is a systematic review published in 2018 with some older uh, studies, 17, um, included up to 2017. It, was, it comprised 79 studies across 14 diseases. And as you could see, the 
the annual disease specific economic cost and all adherence varies, of course, per person um, between like one thousand dollars and and forty five thousand dollars and if you include all cause diseases so not just one particular disease this can be over fifty thousand per person per year and here you see in the graphs below uh, that it also really depends on the type of disease that you're looking at but again i think and and this is even not by drug so even within a specific disease you have multiple types of medicines and i think even here there's a huge variation but of course like cancer treatments as you can see here have a very high cost but it's also related to their uh, the price of the medicines in, in in oncology i assume some specifications from that paper that stood out to me like 10 percent of hospitalizations in older adults were associated with medication non-adherence uh, a typical non-adherent patient requires three extra medical visits annually, leading to up to 2,000 euros or dollars of increased treatment cost. And for diabetes, an example that was highlighted, improving medication adherence could result in cost savings of 600 millions to 1.16 billions annually. It's um, another example. Um, we mostly talked about the economic impact, but we shouldn't forget about the clinical impact and the, even the mortality impact of medicational adherence. And this is, uh, I, I'm quite active in the area of respiratory diseases, and this is one of the, my favorite studies to quote. This is uh, one of the largest COPD trials that has ever been performed, a TORCH study, including over 6,000 patients. And adherence was monitored with uh, a, a monitoring device, just the, um, the dose counter on the inhaler. But uh, after this trial, they did a postdoc analysis uh, dividing patients in a group that took more than 80% of the drug, which is here, the dotted line. And then they looked at the three year follow up period, and 11% died. And then the patients that took less than 80% of their drug. 26% uh, died after three years. And of course, uh, there's some other interesting phenomena. These are associations, of course, and not causal. But if you then look at the follow-up study, which showed very similar uh, results, but even showing differences in groups that not only were not taking the medicine, but even taking them incorrectly, and, and even increasing the risk to over 30% risk of mortality within the first year and these are patients with severe COPD so don't worry about these high mortality risks um, and this was just this, these were COPD patients but also in cardiovascular disease we have seen clear associations of adherent behaviors with better outcomes this is the charm study published in the lancet uh, over 15 years ago now uh, called the Zartan trial where uh, Again, here you can see on the left, uh, during the follow-up time of over three years, here on the left, you see the proportion of life. Patients that were taking more than 80% of either their drug or their placebo, which is quite intriguing, uh, we're, we're showing higher mortality or higher uh, um, survival than patients that took less than 80% of their drug. So, here there's quite some interesting discussions in these type of papers about the potential healthy adherer effect would it be that patients that adhere to their medicine are more healthy in general are they also less frequently smokers or potentially take their co-medication also more in a more adherence matter which would be an additional explanation also for the cupd study that we noticed before but again some clear mortality effects as well which is relatively interesting to me and to better make the case for a general behavior change not just for one drug but probably for the whole health behavior of a patient and similar numbers here, more in the red groups that of the study you saw before, more emergency department visits, more hospital admissions and more mortality. But don't forget also about the indirect costs. Uh, when we're talking about costs, we always think about medication, hospital admissions, consultations. 
but a large share of costs involved in, 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 in society are indirect costs. For example, work absence. And this is one of the few studies looking into this, but it's one of the studies I, I identified a while ago during a systematic review, very nicely presenting patients uh, that were adherent versus patients that were non-adherent. And here you see between for diabetes, uh, uh, chronic heart failure, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and asthma COPD. So up between like three to seven days less work absence in those that adhered to these uh, medicines. And they did a similar analysis for short-term uh, disability. Interesting study and also good to think of when you're measuring effects of your, inter of your adherence interventions to take the broader societal perspective, not just healthcare costs, but also considering these indirect costs of work absence and work productivity. So in economic terms, we have already seen in a previous slide waste of medication if you're not taking it. The medication can expire or is incorrectly used and therefore have no effect. We could see additional consultations. We could see emergency department and hospital admissions. Indirectly, as a consequence, we could see additional, often more expensive medications being prescribed. And then other indirect costs related to work absence, reduced productivity and short-term disability. So with all these serious economic consequences, one would expect that interventions aiming to enhance medication adherence would be very cost effective. But is that true? Um, I was very happy to see when I read the, 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 the Beamer project that part of their uh, title uh, incorporates the word cost effectiveness. So behavior and cost of, and, and adherence model for improving quality health outcomes and cost effectiveness of healthcare. Um, and this is in line with the, the, the WHO report from, from 2003 that has been mentioned uh, before. Increasing the effectiveness of adherence interventions may have a far greater impact on the health of the population than any improvement in specific, specific medical treatments. So consistent cost savings were fine all the time. But let's look at some of the case studies in this area. First, for those of you not familiar with cost effectiveness analysis, cost effectiveness analysis is not only about costs. It's, about, it's finding the right balance between the incremental cost here on the y-axis versus the effects we are seeing, the incremental health that we are gaining with our intervention. And we assume with usual care is the same as doing nothing. So don't change anything. But the thing with adherence interventions is that we usually first have to invest a little bit. We need to make some cost, and we're not sure yet how much health it would give us, but also if our cost that we're making here would be offset and we're ending up in this southeast quadrant. So if you look at the cost effectiveness plane, you have four quadrants. Um, you could say, okay, my intervention will cost money. So it's up here from usual care and it uh, uh, gives us worse health. So you would end up in the red part on the left, the Northwest quadrant. On the Southeast is where we all wanna be. So we wanna save cost and gain health. So the green Southeast part. Quite often we actually we, we turn, up, turn, out, turn out to uh, to be here in this part. And this is more a part where policymakers have heavy debates whether or not they should see an intervention as being cost effective or not. So this depends on how much money are we willing to spend to buy some additional health. Is this 50,000 uh, per like additional life year or even a quality adjusted life year? or only 20,000. And, and these are some debates. We, we are still finding ourselves also for, for a cost effectiveness analysis of, of adherence enhancing interventions, because there are some very effective ones. Some have been proven to be cost effective even, as you could see here, this is an example uh, of, of one of the studies I did a few years ago on an adherence enhancing interventions for COPD. We noticed some um, some additional cost at the beginning to provide the intervention of 77 euros. This would increase adherence, so also medication cost. But we had 
considerable savings that offset all the costs, all the investments we did at the beginning and ended up in savings of 227 euros per year for, for patients being part of this intervention. So it was a very cost saving intervention. And this was for COPD, but again, also for years and HIV, a very nice trial of Marijn de Bruyne also showing cost savings uh, for patients. We have seen the same in cardiovascular disease. Um, in, but however, if we look at systematic reviews of cost effectiveness analysis for, for adherence enhancing interventions, we see notable differences in the quality of the cost effectiveness analysis being performed. And also the effectiveness is not always shown for adherence interventions. I think Rob nicely laid out that we still sometimes are stuck in our one size fits all interventions like so let's send reminders to everybody because but not, all, not everybody is needing reminders if they don't believe in the medicine. So we are still also still need to figure out how to make our intervention effective. And even if cost effectiveness is shown, it's not sufficient for implementation and reimbursement. This is because insurers also often ask about the budget impacts and not all, so the, the affordable expenditure, if they would be going to provide their interventions to uh, a total population or maybe a subpopulation. So they look at the size of the eligible population, the treatment mix, the cost of the treatment mixes and the changes in condition related costs. So always think about a budget impact analysis as well, besides doing cost effectiveness. And how to optimize cost effectiveness. I've been thinking a lot about this and here I try to summarize a little bit and it's in line with some of the models, of course, and how we can personalize and target our intervention. So we need to, in my opinion, we need to look at big data and, and health economics first to, to look at risk stratification. Who are the, what's the low hanging fruit? Where can we, uh, have the, the, the best, the most of the savings. How can we make sure we are targeting the, the, the non-adherent population? How can we monitor them? And we have increased possibilities there with, with e-health nowadays. Interventions need to, take, need to be personalized to the patient behavior as, as, as Rob uh, very nicely explained and can poss possibly be supported by, by e-health and m-health. And then uh, one of the other challenges, the implementation, we need to talk about awareness as, as uh, John said at the beginning, still many of us are not aware and healthcare systems are not aware of the issue. We need training for professionals, we need integration systems and most importantly, we need reimbursement of adherence enhancing interventions because else people don't have time. You notice the five minutes consultation, you cannot do the whole uh, Papa model, for example, that it represented in five minutes. I think you need much, much, much more time. Um, so I'm very happy to see um, that the, the current European projects, the ABC project, the Enable project is the cost action and the Beamer project have some cost elements uh, uh, in there, and I hope this could uh, really bring us further in also building the right business case for our adherence enhancing interventions. So in conclusion, non-adherence is frequent, results in significant clinical and economic burden. If adherence can be successfully improved, this can be a very cost-effective strategy. Medication adherence data integrated into decision support between patients and healthcare providers can help enabling cost-effective and personalized healthcare and we have to admit an implementation of adherence uh, support uh, remains a big challenge. If there's any questions, here's uh, our website of our center, adherence at UMCG, and the cost action you can see at enableadherence.eu or the cost action website. And this is a list of uh, some of the references that I provided. Thank you very much. And, and I'm looking forward to our uh, discussion. Thanks uh, a lot, Job, for this uh, really fantastic talk. And uh, we 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 go now to open the discussion. Um, I will ask to the people that have already posed some questions in the in the chat to switch on their camera and to do the 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 questions themselves because I think it will be important to 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 have uh, a conversation and. Uh, uh, a really uh, share of knowledge. So we have here already a first question. Um, so, but I, honestly, Anupala, 
I, I couldn't pronounce this name. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry for this. Ulupoma. Oh, uh, okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, I actually have two questions. I think the first question is actually pretty much common sense, but I just don't see it in the policy and decision makers as much as I would like I what I wrote in the chat that when we talk about enabling patients to adhere to the treatment, you know, they probably need much more support than a five or 10 minute consultation with the doctor. So maybe they need a longer conversation and doctors can't do that, but we can provide with other uh, paramedical professionals like maybe nurses or paramedics or some other kind of um, care professionals, whatever is possible within the healthcare system. Uh, so when uh, we always bring up these things, the, the question becomes, okay, then it will cost a lot. But I think um, what uh, the last presenter showed us, the, what is the actual cost of non-adherence and how big that can be, then, then the common sense question is, how much would it cost to invest in this kind of profession, creating uh, supporting services for the patients to increase adherence versus what we are um, having as the burden of you know, um, non-adherence? Uh, that's the first question and open to all the presenters. I'm happy, uh, happy to take that on uh, if you want. Um, uh, and, and I think the burden is clear and then we, we, I think I provided quite an extensive overview, but it depends indeed on the, on the forefront. So what are you doing? You're making your cost first usually. So there's, and, and, and that can be of any size. If you're increasing your, your consultation time with five minutes, this would have a different cost implication that if you are start using a, a patented, very expensive technological solution, probably. So it, it's difficult to say this in general, and you need to, that, that's where, what cost effectiveness analysis are for, to find that right balance in how much could you invest upfront and what are your gains um, in the future, and these gains could be partly in cost savings, but could also be in health gains. Um, but in general, the first thing you need to do is show effectiveness of your intervention. And if it's effective, your second step is, is it also cost effective? And then if it's cost effective, is it affordable for, uh, for society to buy that interventions and integrate it into a healthcare system? Then the next step is also can everybody implement it? So do you need to train your, your workforce, your, your healthcare professionals? So it's a stepwise approach. And then the business case is, might be different for, for the, the interventions you're talking about. If I'm allowed, the second question is in, in many uh, healthcare system design, uh, there is this mismatch of conceptions from the patient side, uh, some of them feel like, okay, doctors are put there as gatekeeper, gatekeepers to actually reduce the cost of care. It's kind of like, okay, patients are alien from Mars. If we don't stop them at the gate, they will just colonize all the hospitals and drive the care cost upwards. Uh, how can we, or is, is there any advice from you to change that concept to, okay, the doctors are not put there as gatekeeper to keep the cost down. They are put there to increase the health and value in, he value in health for patients and the wider society. What, what can we do there to um, you know, improve adherence by perception change? Is this one for John as a public health issue here? <laughs> for everyone actually <laughs> uh, hold on yeah I, th I think it's for everyone i mean uh, i i should have said at the beginning of my talk i'm not a public health person at all i was just given this title i'm just a humble psychologist um 
I actually think, Yorba, I think it's sort of one for you in a way. I don't want to pass the buck. I can say something, but I'd, I'd be interested in this because there is this concept in healthcare about, you know, that, well, the, the, the panic of healthcare providers is this whole escalation. You know, it's just healthcare costs are infinite. They, they'll go on forever. So how one introduces some sort of system of limiting costs or, you know, limiting act and so on is a really, you know, it, it's a, a policy issue as much as a health economic issue. But I'm interested to know that sort of health economic perspective because there's always this trade-off between, you know, you provide better access, make people more satisfied with healthcare, their health improves, therefore they shouldn't be needing to use the system as much which I think is where you're coming from, but somehow people turn the whole thing on its head saying, oh, you know, we have to, as you say, create limitations of access because otherwise things would just spiral out of control. And I'm not sure how, how true that is. I mean, I know there are health economic analyses of different healthcare systems with different types of patient access, different consultation times. You know, a country like Sweden, you know, that's long, really long consultation times on average, you know, 20, 25 minutes. Um, but it's the healthcare there is organized in a very different way. You know, it's a state-based healthcare, whereas in the US, you know, where consultation times are equally long, it's all insurance-based, you know. Um, so, if, you know, the system is self-limiting. You know, if you don't have the money, you don't get the access, you know. So, I, I still think this is a health economic question. Yeah, yeah I could agree with that. I had the, the previous one. I didn't want to uh, pass you off for the public health part that's also involved. But um, so, so to be clear to Anu um, so you would say we shouldn't restrict access to primary care and as gatekeepers because and there's even... And those systems are in place. So, so in, in, I'm from the Netherlands. We have primary care as gatekeepers, indeed. But there's many countries where you can go directly to specialists or directly to the hospitals. And it's not always that those systems are more expensive. Um, they can, in some countries, they are. But the cost of healthcare are, are, are mostly linked also to, to, of course, the national income as well, so the, the gross uh, domestic product. Um, but I know, and also the countries like Sweden that was mentioned, they have like health economics as an integrated part of, of what they cover as part of their, their reimbursement. Um, this is also important. And the problem with Adherence interventions that I, that I stressed in my presentation is that they're usually not reimbursed. And we, we are now with the Enable Network, we're doing a review uh, of adherent of the reimbursement status of adherence enhancing interventions across Europe. And I'm quite disappointed actually how few they are reimbursed. And if they're not reimbursed, they're usually not being taken up. But I think many of these interventions could easily be performed. Uh, primary care, nurses, pharmacists, not always physicians, maybe, um, but, but at least give them more time. Um, and then I, on the long term, it will definitely uh, pay off. Can I, um, can I come in there, Yul? But I, I just wondered if we can take a different perspective on this, because we're saying, like, we're assuming that better quality adherence support will cost more. And um, I think I, I would um, agree that there may be additional costs, but I'd also kind of challenge that. I don't think we can make that assumption. There's a lot more that we could do, which is um, not necessarily to do more, but just do better. And an example would be, I sort of skirted through it, but I showed um, a digital application where we can address people, identify and address people's adherence beliefs uh, using sort of set messages and an algorithm, that's actually gonna, you know, you don't need a practitioner to do that necessarily. Also, you know, it's about making the best use of the available time. So if we were better able to identify the real barriers to adherence, including beliefs, 
and uh, have better ways of overcoming those, then we could do it quite efficiently, I think. So the increasing cost of good quality adherence support may not be as big as we think. It's not, we just need to do it differently. So the pharmaceutical industry, for example, spends an awful lot of money communicating medicines to patients, but generally it's done inefficient, ineffectively and quite badly. So doing that, you know, putting some of that resource into doing it better, likewise with health services. So, uh, you know, we've looked at pharmacists delivering adherence support over the telephone and that can be uh, effective. So I think it's, I would be optimistic <laughs> actually that we can do more without necessarily you know, really, really having to invest huge amounts more. We just perhaps need to do it differently. So, um, you know, that's not to say that all the economic points that uh, Job was making are, 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 they're all relevant, but I think it may be the costs that we need to be worrying about may not be as much as we think. And we, we might want to look at it from that angle as well. I agree, uh, Rob. Overall, this is going to lead to cost savings, and that's what we're always telling. But up front, we still need, even if you want to have pharmacists providing this or having doctors doing different, more efficient consultations, they still need to be trained a little bit to do this. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. And that will cost a bit of upfront investment, yeah. and it's going to pay off on the long term. And this is, what, in my conversations with insurers, quite difficult often, that they don't want to take that risk of, they being the one investing and then on the long term another insurer is going to take the benefit if the patient would go over to a different insurer for example see i do wonder whether there you know there may be i completely agree but i wonder if there may be scope for industry healthcare system partnerships in this space you know to uh, to make best use of what because both the interests of patients the healthcare provider and the industry are um, coalesce around adherence if the prescription was right. Okay, let's move for other questions uh, because, and do you want to pose your question? I think is uh, is a very important question. And Moon. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Elisio, and congratulations on this very interesting uh, webinar. And thank you to the speakers for very insightful conversations. I have a question that I am somewhat grappling with it. and uh, or before I make a comment, before I post my question, I would actually comment that Beamer, the Beamer project and uh, as well as the Gravitate Health project that I'm coordinating do have the potential for health professionals, most importantly patients and the industry to come together to, to make a difference in this space. But my questions to you guys is um, a more foundational one. When you say that something is non-adherent, what is the reference point? Or how do you define uh, adherence? You talk about adherence beliefs, you talk about the gap, you talk about this, uh, the problems, the costs, we are all concerned. But how uh, how, what, is the, what is your reference point when you say something is non-adherent and what is your definition? Thank you. Uh, I think, I guess everybody can answer that in different ways, but yeah. I think you have to distinguish between the behavior, adherence being a behavior. So we're looking at what somebody's doing or in the case of non-adherence, what somebody's not doing. So first of all, there's a sort of description of the behavior and then that obviously will vary across different sorts of treatments, types of treatments, so on. So we can actually describe how much of this thing is this person taking, you know, how much do they engage in this behavior. But then from a clinical perspective, and I think this is often where it starts to get a bit crude, um, how much do they need to take? And uh, so we know for, you know, for some medicines, absolutely, you know, you have to take pretty well the lot and if you don't, you don't get any benefits. So there, anything less than pretty well, you know, 95% plus is non-adherence. So there's the if, notion of you know, effective adherence and the level that you need to take. So that adds a sort of a, a, a you know, a clinical justification. Um, and then all the other things I think we looked at were, were, we were looking at trying to explain that level of behavior. So I think, you know, we, if we think about the behavior we can describe the behavior. If we want to call it adherent or non-adherent, we can, or we can call it a level of adherence. 
So we don't use the binary classification of adherent, non-adherent, which can be a mistake, uh, but people always like to stick with that. And if we do that, then we need, I think, some clinical um, guideline into that. But I know, Rob, Rob I know you've, you've looked at this more than me. Uh, Rob, if, do you I may just, if I may just follow up, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to understand better is what the subjective, maybe it's the subjective uh, dimensions where, uh, well, how do you value, how do you, what is the reference point for the behavior? Uh, that you are observing. That's sort of <laughs> where I'm where I'm grappling. But yeah, thank you. You mean the reference point as by the, the original prescription of the of the doctor? Well, so I, some I definitions be... say the extent to which you are following the prescription of the doctor, for example. Um, is... This is a definition you sometimes see, but, but as John Kelly definition? explained, it's more than that. But is this your definition when you say something is effective, cost-effective, affordable, implementable? That's what I'm saying, because uh, it might be that uh, with all respect that the prescription is not the gold standard. Yeah, definitely. And, but, but that's, I think, what John clearly was saying that if it's clinically effective for that particular person, that's the question that we don't mm -hmm. always know. Mm -hmm. So we, we make an assumption, don't we, that if the prescription was uh, right for that individual, then generally speaking, if the person takes, follows the advice for taking it, it's better than if they don't. So the whole thing is predicated on that mm -hmm. idea, but you can't guarantee that for the individual and the medical system doesn't work in that way. It works based on, you know, likelihoods. So, so we can't ever guarantee that high adherence is uh, definitely better than low adherence, but the whole field is based on the premise mm -hmm. that if it is agreed between the patient and the prescriber, that the prescription is the best course of action uh, for that patient based on evidence and all other characteristics, then the degree to which the patient follows the recommendation, we assume is really, will be related to the outcome. So that's the reference point for me is, you know, how, whether the patient uh, behavior matches the, the recommendation, mm -hmm. because if it doesn't, we assume that that's problematic. And I pose a question about it. There is a, a no adherent, we can identify a profile of people, no adherent. Um, and, uh, because in fact, and you tell this here, we um, uh, we we can be no adherent uh, uh, in the same patient using different medicines or different drugs. So the same person can be adherent or no adherent. Can we have a profile of no adherent person? No. Or all of us. <laughs> can be adherent and no adherent. Well, um, my, my really, um, I, I, I think it's the wrong question in a way, you know, to solve the problem, because it's not, we need to understand the interaction between the individual and the particular treatment. So trying to get a profile of a so-called non-adherent patient, we'd all be in there. So it's of limited value. What you can do, I think, is to understand the key barriers and profile the individual in terms of those key modifiable barriers. I think that's where the science points us, uh, rather than trying to identify, you know, this sort of non-adherent, deviant patient. You know, I don't think it works because it's all of us at some point. <laughs> also, if there's no clinical relevant issue, probably, and the patient is not taking everything, why should you intervene? <laughs> <laughs> so let's move because we 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 are already in our time limit uh, and i want to choose here one or two more questions uh uh eva do you want to do your question yes thank you thank you very much for the presentations i was just wondering with uh, with regard to uh, when you mentioned the storytelling rob and i saw that you already posted some examples there for me, it was really uh, how can we change? Uh, how can we change the stories towards the patients, towards the health professionals, 
to to really uh, go into a different kind of narrative. Um, so, because we we are also, I, I work uh, on both projects, Beamer and the Gravitate Health, and we are looking into you know how can we then uh, address uh, people to to who are you know hard to to reach uh, when it comes to to being adherent. So this is why I was wondering when when you mentioned the different types of stories. Um, if that would, uh, you know, having some good examples on how to tailor the message. Yeah, and I think I think the examples are kind of there from um, understanding, you know, why someone is hard to reach. Okay, what makes them hard to reach, um, in my view, is that they often have a set of ideas which are different to the doctors. Okay, but I gave some examples of common what I call common sense defaults, right, which are common ways of thinking. And a classic one is, hey, you know, I've been taking this medicine now for like 10 weeks, okay, and I feel okay. So why do I need to keep taking it beyond that? Most of my experience before I got a long-term condition was I knew when I was ill, I felt ill, I knew when I was better, I felt better. I don't need to take medicine all the time. So that's a common sense default, which if we explain to patients that actually this is a medicine that you can't necessarily feel that it's working, right? Just simple things like that, which we don't do. But of course, different people have different common sense defaults. So the trick is how you can tailor to, the, to each individual. But there's, there are some advances in how we can do that, I think, in the literature uh, you know, now. Thank you. Let's move for a last question because we are. Uh, uh, Simon, Judith, do you want to, to, to do your question? Simon. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I, 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 I put it in, in, into the chat, but, but uh, I, I can ask you whether you have some experience, some results, some estimations about the, the uh, change of adherence, non-adherence rate affected by the pandemic situation. I suppose it's a, it's a, it, it was a very unexpected situation for <laughs> everybody, uh, and especially the, the patients with uh, chronic diseases, they are a, a more uh, vulnerable group for uh, they, uh, it, it uh, has been communicated from all, all channels. And, uh, and uh, do you think it, it, it would be reasonable that the adherence to chronic disease uh, would have uh, increased, would have Im improved, uh, uh, affected by this situation? But uh, it is my question, what, 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 what do you think, what, uh, whether you have some results about it? Thank you. Yeah, I've been involved in a couple of quite big studies looking at changes in adherence during the pandemic, one in diabetes, one in psoriasis. And in both cases, there's evidence um, that adherence is reduced, uh, not, mass not massively, but it's, it's worsened mm -hmm. and for different reasons. Um, just, you know, as Rob was talking about, you need to find the reasons for in psoriasis, the reasons seem to be particularly around um, people's worries that um, by taking their targeted medication, a biologic medication, they would be reducing their own immunity. And they would be more vulnerable to um, COVID infections. Um, so, the, um, so around um, in that study, it's a very big international study in psoriasis and um, around 25% uh, of patients said they had um, uh, they, they were not so adherent. I mean, it was a very simple mm -hmm. question, so, but, and, and that was the most common reason. Um, in diabetes, um, it was a similar story, but the, the reasons varied, but again, there were reductions. And I think you have to think that, you know, what, what's happening in COVID, obviously people are not seeing their doctors. They're having, you know, they're doing like we are today. They're Zooming if they're lucky or they're on the telephone. Maybe that communication is not so effective. And uh, many people, you know, with serious conditions are, um, you know, particularly, you know, I, I may actually have increased levels of anxiety and stress and so on. And again, we know 
the changes in mood can impact day-to-day -day behavior, you know, they can impact working memory, they can inter interfere with planning and so on and so forth. So they're the only two insights I have. And, uh, and yeah, Judith, it's nice to see you. So yeah. hello. <laughs> nice to see you, John. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, yeah, Rob, you may well have been other insights. Um, I think that's really interesting, John. The point I was going to make, I think you would put something in the chat about some evidence that um, asthma adherence actually increased. And to me, you see, the that, that shouldn't surprise us that we get this mixed pattern because you could imagine people, uh, jo John's uh, study showed, you know, people saying, well, I'm taking immunosuppressant medicines. Surely that's going to make me more susceptible to COVID, you know, very logical common sense. Um, but with asthma, you could see people thinking differently. This is a respiratory infection. I need to make sure I don't get an asthma attack. So I'm going to put even more attention. It increases their necessity perception for the asthma medication, whereas it increases their concern for the um, psoriasis medication. So you get mixed effect, right? Um, so I think the key to understanding the variation is, again, looking at how people are thinking about this in their common sense way. Absolutely. Um, everybody, I have to leave. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, just, I'm getting a rude message that I'm not in another meeting now. Um, I would prefer to stay in, I prefer to stay in this meeting. So great. And uh, Rob will have a chat soon. It's good to see you, John. Yeah, um, yeah. You're, bye, everybody. Bye, bye Judith. Yeah. I, I'm afraid, everybody, I'm I'm in a similar situation to John. I, I also have to go now, but yeah. I've really enjoyed this um, meeting and great to see everybody. And thank you very uh, much for inviting me. Yeah, it is a, a pleasure. I, we need to finish this webinar. Uh, this right. has been real fantastic. Uh, share all the information and uh, uh, I want to thank to all of you to attend this webinar please continue to follow Beamer through LinkedIn or Twitter uh, and we have our next webinar in 28th of March or uh, next month at the same time at the same time and we're going to, to talk about adherence in clinical practice. See you soon, all of you. Uh, and thanks again.